This is the third video in the series on pure competition. In the first of these videos, we defined what pure competition is and distinguished it from the other market models we'll be examining. Pure monopoly, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly, as we study the microeconomics of the individual firm. In the second video, we developed the revenue relationships of a purely competitive firm and juxtaposed them with the cost relationships, which, of course, are the same for all firms. We then developed the profit maximizing rule. Firms should produce every unit and fraction thereof, for which the marginal revenue exceeds the marginal cost. In short, the firm will maximize profits by producing that quantity of output for which marginal revenue equals marginal cost. In this video, we will examine the equilibrium conditions for a purely competitive firm and consider their implications for macroeconomic efficiency, namely, allocative efficiency and productive efficiency. Here are the revenue and cost relationships for a purely competitive firm that is similar, but not identical to the graph in the previous video we used for deriving the profit maximizing rule. I'll explain the difference in just a few minutes. Here is where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So, the profit maximizing firm will produce this quantity of output. We know how many units of output the firm will produce, even though we haven't specified the exact number of units along the Q axis. But is the firm in equilibrium? Or, will things soon be changing? Recall that one of the preconditions for pure competition is that there are no barriers to entry. That is, Entrepreneurs can quickly and costlessly move resources into the industry in order to chase the economic profits that may exist. The question that arises is, is this firm and all the others in the industry, which by the way, have identical cost relationships, because they all have access to and are knowledgeable of the same technology, earning economic profits? Profit, as you know, is the difference between total revenue and Total cost. We're using the Greek letter P here to represent profits. The Roman letter P is already used to represent price. We don't see total revenue or total cost on this graph, but we do see average revenue and average total cost. We can derive those values easily enough simply by dividing this equation through by Q. And what we see then is profits over Q, which we could call per unit profit, is equal to average revenue minus average total cost. This distance here then, represents per unit profits at the profit maximizing level of output. As you can see, this firm is making a profit by virtue of the fact that average revenue exceeds average total cost. But, this distance represents average, or, per unit profit. What do total profits look like? If we were to multiply, per unit profit by Q, we get total profit. Here's the distance Q on the graph. When we multiply per unit profits, the bracketed vertical distance, by Q, the bracketed horizontal distance, we get the area of this blue box. We can call this the total profit box because its area is, per unit profit times, quantity, the number of units produced. Given this market price, which this purely competitive firm must accept, there is no other level of output that would give a larger profit box. This level of output, for example, would produce a smaller profit box. As would, this level of output. So, this firm is maximizing its profits, given this market price. Now, let's return to the question, is this firm in equilibrium? Or, will the situation soon be, changing? Given the fact that there are no barriers to entry, this situation will soon be changing. Potential entrepreneurs are eager to bring resources into this industry to take advantage of these economic profits. Note the use of the term, economic profits. It's important, at this point, to distinguish economic profits from accounting profits. A full and complete explanation of the distinction between the two are in the essay entitled, Economic versus Accounting Profits in the lecture notes section of the course website, on Blackboard. Both are computed as total revenue minus total cost. The difference lies in the way in which costs are computed. Accounting costs are computed as the sum of the payments to land, labor and capital. Economic costs on the other hand, 
are computed as the sum of the payments to land labor and capital, plus the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur. The reason that this distinction is made at this point is because an accounting profit of say, one cent, will not draw resources into the industry. When we consider the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur, an accounting profit of only one cent would result in an economic loss. It is only economic profits, not necessarily accounting profits, that will attract resources into the industry. In computing total costs, from which these cost relationships were derived, the opportunity cost of the entrepreneur was included. Because these cost curves reflect both cash outlays and the entrepreneur's opportunity cost, these profits shown on this graph are economic profits. Entrepreneurs, eager to earn economic profits, coupled with the absence of any barriers to entry, will cause resources to flow into this industry. With all these additional firms producing this good or service, the market supply will increase and the market price will fall, causing the demand curve and all the revenue curves to shift down to the new, lower price. Let's now reassess these new market conditions for this industry. First, notice the new point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. This profit-maximizing firm will produce less output. In addition, per unit profits are lower. As are, total profits. But, as long as there are economic profits being made in this industry, resources will continue to flood in. As they do, the market supply will continue to rise, the price will continue to fall, and the demand curve, along with the average revenue and marginal revenue curves will shift down. Let's suppose it shifts all the way down to here. So let's reassess the current market situation. Here is the new point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So we know that the new quantity of output that this firm will produce will be here. As you can see, the firm will maximize its profits by once again, producing fewer units. And here is the difference between average revenue and average total cost. But, notice that because average total cost exceeds average revenue, these economic profits are negative. Negative economic profits are of course, economic losses. This yellow box represents total economic losses. It would seem that, just as economic profits attracted resources into the industry, economic losses would drive resources out of the industry. After all, not only are there no barriers to entry, but there are also no barriers to exit. This reasoning makes perfect intuitive sense, but, there's a complication that we need to deal with here. Instead of leaving the industry immediately, this firm will choose to suffer these losses and wait for other firms to leave. When they do, the market supply will go down and the product price will go back up, along with the demand curve. And, eventually, the losses will turn back into profits. The reason for waiting is this. Because fixed costs will not go away if this firm shuts down and produces zero units of output, it will lose less if it continues producing, so long as average revenue is covering its average variable costs. Before we continue analyzing this model of the purely competitive firm, let's deal with this basic economic principle. A firm will continue operations and produce that output, at which marginal revenue equals marginal cost, despite that it may be suffering economic losses, so long as its revenue is covering its variable costs. The reason is that it will continue to be responsible for its contractual obligations, which are its fixed cost, until the contracts expire. Until that time, losses will be greater if they shut down than if they continue to produce that level of output for which marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Let's see why this is the case by use of a table. We'll start with this column we'll call, R. R will stand for revenue. The next column, FC will stand for fixed costs. The third column, BC, will stand for variable costs. And TC of course, will stand for total costs. This next column, PI, with a subscript P will represent the firm's profits, if it produces that output for which marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. The subscript P stands for produces. This final column, PI sub zero, represents the profits the firm would earn if it shut down and produced zero units of output. Obviously, the values in this column will be negative, representing economic losses. Suppose that revenue is $200, fixed costs are 100, 
and variable costs are 50. Obviously, total costs will be 150. Profits, revenue minus total cost, will be $50. But, if the firm does not produce, its revenue will be zero, its variable costs will be zero, but fixed costs will not fall to zero until the firm's contractual obligations expire, at some point in the future. Therefore, total costs will equal fixed costs, and its losses, if it produces no output will be $100. Notice that in this case, it's better to produce than to shut down. That's because this firm's revenue exceeds its variable costs. Consider this second case. Revenue and fixed costs are the same as the first case, but variable costs are a little bit higher. Take a close look at these numbers. Pause the video if you'd like, and verify that if the firm produced, it would earn profits of $10, but, as in the first case, if it shut down, it would lose $100. As in the first case, it's better to produce than to shut down. Notice that in both cases, the revenue exceeds the variable costs. In this third case, the variable cost has risen to 100. But, if we compare producing to shutting down, we see that producing is better, even though the firm's economic profits are zero. Again, it's better to produce in this case because revenue is greater than variable cost. In this fourth case, the variable costs have gone up again. But, when comparing the options of producing to shutting down, producing is the better option. Even though the firm is taking losses by producing where MR equals MC, the losses from shutting down would be greater. It's better to produce because, to repeat, revenue from producing exceeds its variable cost. The reason that the relationship between revenue and variable cost is important, in determining whether to produce or shut down, is because, the surplus of revenue over variable cost can be used to take a bite out of its fixed cost obligation. When a firm produces zero units of output, it receives no revenue, but faces its full fixed cost obligations. In this, the fifth case, variable cost has risen to $199, $1 short of its revenue. But, notice that it's still better to produce than to shut down, even though the firm is taking losses. But, in this sixth case, variable cost has risen to $1 greater than revenue. Because the firm's revenue is no longer covering its variable cost, it can no longer use that surplus to reduce its fixed cost obligations. As a result, it's better to shut down than to produce. Here's another case where variable cost is greater than revenue. It should be clear by now that if revenue covers variable costs, the firm should continue producing, even if it is taking losses. And, by the same reasoning, if the revenue fails to cover variable costs, the firm should shut down. Because this firm represented by this graph is taking losses, should it shut down completely, or should it continue producing and just accept the losses? Obviously, it should accept the losses. Because average revenue is greater than average variable cost, shutting down would cause the losses to be greater. Producing at the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, the losses are minimized. This firm would realize that these losses were temporary. It would hold on until the fixed cost obligations of other firms in the industry expired. When that happens, those firms would exit the industry because their fixed cost obligations have fallen to zero. With fewer firms now producing the product, the product price would then rise, along with the demand curve. If the price fell to this low point, however, the firm would shut down. Revenue is no longer covering variable cost, so continuing production would cause losses to be greater than shutting down. The existence of economic profits, coupled with no barriers to entry, will attract resources into the industry. The market supply will rise, and the product price and the demand curve will fall. If the price were to fall to here, firms would suffer economic losses and they would leave the industry. As they did, market supply would fall, the product price and the demand curve will rise. Take a good long look at this graph. Pause the video if you need to. Where will equilibrium occur? Right here. What is the significance of this point? 
For one thing, this is where marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal. Therefore, the firm, if it wishes to maximize its profits, will produce this level of output. But, notice also that average revenue, at this level of output, is equal to average total cost. That means that economic profits, are zero. With zero economic profits, there will be no incentive for resources to enter the industry. But won't firms exit the industry if profits are zero? No. Remember, these are economic profits. Not accounting profits. When economic profits are zero, the entrepreneur is earning a dollar amount that is equal to his opportunity cost. So, here is a firm in equilibrium in a purely competitive market. The entrepreneur is earning zero economic profits. Don't worry though. He is not starving. He is earning accounting profits that are equal to that which he would earn at his next best opportunity. When accounting profits are equal to what the entrepreneur would earn at his next best opportunity, economists refer to this as normal profits. Normal profits will neither attract nor repel resources. Thus, the firm is in equilibrium. The next and final video in this series on pure competition will address the efficiency implications of this equilibrium. What are the efficiency implications? And what does that even mean? Check out the next video.